Welcome. Welcome to IAM 302 Create Enterprise Wide Preventive Guardrails featuring Inter and Co. Um, let's start with some quick introductions. Tulio, would you like to go first? Sure, Swara. Hello, everybody. My name is Tulio Bita, and I work as a senior cloud security architect at Inter and Co. Thank you, Tulio. And I'm Swara Gandhi. I am a solutions architect with AWS Identity. Uh, I've been with AWS for a little over four years now, very focused on governance and controls that you put in place for your AWS environments. So today we are going to talk about a topic that is very near and dear to me, which is setting preventive guardrails using service control policies. So in, for preventive guardrails in AWS, SCPs are a way to do it. So we'll start with a quick overview of what service control policies are. We will do a quick rundown the key considerations or kind of like the techniques that we talk to our customers about when they run into the quota limits when they are implementing SCPs. And then we have some really cool AWS organization structures to show you. So this is something that I hear from customers all the time, which is show us how other customers are doing it show us what were the issues that they ran into when they implemented service control policies so, so that we can take those learnings and then we don't invest that much time in the strategy and then we do not run into those issues ourselves. So the structure is part of that. We'll show you how most of our customers are organizing AWS accounts when they grow from 10 to 100 to thousands of accounts for implementing SCPs. And as you grow organically or with mergers and acquisitions, operations become an integral part of maintaining those controls. So we'll touch base on the operations of it. And then we have Inter and Co with us today. Uh, they're a big Brazilian bank. Uh, Tulio will showcase how they scaled their SCP usage and how SCPs look today in practice in their production environment. And finally, we will wrap up with some clear takeaways uh, which will be sprinkled throughout the talk as well. So let's go ahead and get started with some definitions. So what are service control policies? Now, we see a lot of customers like you using AWS organizations to manage multiple AWS accounts. And there are a lot of benefits to having multiple AWS accounts. Maybe you want to cre create that isolation between those accounts based on the application their ownership, maybe you have some compliance and regulatory needs. So if you have multiple AWS accounts, as they grow, as we talked about like 10 to 100 to thousands, you look for a central way to set guardrails around them. So service control policies are a way to do it. With service control policies, you can set the maximum allowable permissions for all those accounts that are in your organization. So let's talk about an example. If you use AWS CloudTrail today, you can use AWS CloudTrail logs to look into the logs and see the API calls being made against your AWS accounts. And this is a very important tool for your security team. You can put a control using SCP that says, do not allow any account in my organization to go ahead and modify or delete those logs because my security team will need it. So you can put that kind of control in SCP. You can apply service control policies at different layers in your organization. So you can apply it at the root level, in which case it will be applicable to all the AWS accounts in your organization. You can apply it at the OU level, which is organization unit level, or a member account level as well. Or you can apply three policies at all the three layers as well. So it really simplifies those permissions at scale for you. Because you can apply SCPs at different layers in your organization, it's important to understand how do they work or are evaluated so that you get the right outcome when you are writing them. So like any IAM policy, SCPs also support allow and deny statements. Uh, but they work a little bit differently when SCPs are evaluated. So I wanted to touch base on that before we go ahead and jump into the key considerations. So starting with SCPs with allow, 
So let's say you want to allow a particular service or a permission to be allowed at this member account layer where you have that small green flag. So let's say you want to allow S3 buckets to be created by your developers at that member account level. If you're writing a allow statement that is allowing that S3 permission, you need to attach a SCP at all the levels that are in the direct path to your member account. So you need three allow statements at each level along the path to that member account that allows S3 as a service. So you need three allows, that's important. But it is different for denies. So let's say for the same member account, you wanna deny use of any machine learning services. Maybe you are just getting started, you have still not vetted, the AWS machine learning services, and you do not want your developers to be using them in that member account. In this case, you can have a deny statement either attached at the root level or the OU level or the member account level. Only one deny is needed that says deny use of machine learning services. You do not need to have that deny at all the layers in the direct path. So there is a very key distinction between how allows and denies are evaluated for SCPs. Now in practice, when you're writing SCPs, you will make use of both. You will make use of deny statements and allow statements to allow and deny certain permissions and services in your environment. But it's important to understand this distinction. So we talked about what service control policies are. We looked at how they work with allows and denies. Now these are the key considerations and kind of like the techniques that I recommend my customers when they're writing SCPs or when they're running into SCP quota issues as they scale in terms of AWS accounts, in terms of controls that they put in place. So the first one is design your OU structure that reflects your security and operational needs or it can reflect your compliance and data residency needs. But please do not replicate your organization's reporting structure in the OU structure that you use to group accounts in AWS. So if you have multiple accounts that perform similar or related functions, you can benefit by grouping them into a top level OU so that your security team can understand your AWS structure better, your account structure better, and then it makes it easier for them to apply those security controls at that top OU level rather than at individual account level. Because as the number of accounts grow in your environment, maintaining all those policies will become difficult. And you do not want a lot of policies, service control policies attached to a number of accounts. So we say start small and broad. Start with broad layer, one top layer, layer of OU, and then expand as needed. You can have five level deep OU structures. You can have nested OUs. And the maximum, per, maximum SCPs that you can attach to one OU is five. So that number is limited. You cannot increase that. So it's important how you design your OU structure. It depends how many SCPs you can leverage as well. So that's, that was the first key consideration. Before I go and jump into my favorite part, which is showing you the structure of AWS organization that we see a lot of our customers use, we have a polling question for you that will also uh, help us learn more about how you use SCPs today. So uh, if you can take out your smartphones, go ahead and scan the QR code on the screen over here. The question is, did you consider SCPs while designing your OU structure or while arranging your accounts in AWS? We'll wait for like 60 seconds before we get all the results in. Okay, so let's look at the results. Oh, perfect, so I see a lot of you considered SCPs. I wonder if you already knew about the SCP quotas before. Okay, so that's perfect. But if you did not, for the 28% of you who replied no, let's look at how the organization structure 
should look like and how it will impact your number of SCPs. So, for a lot of our customers, we see them getting started with what AWS recommends. They use this kind of organization structure as version one. And then this can evolve over time as you scale and you have more controls that you want to put in place. Maybe you have other considerations. But this is normally used as version one, where you have your root, you have your management account, you have your infrastructure OU, organization unit, that has all the shared services for you. You have your security OU that hosts your security tooling and log archives. And then you have your workloads OU, which actually, actually is hosting your workloads, your applications. And then you can have a suspended OU where you move accounts when people leave your organization or company. And then you can have another layer of OU to differentiate the production and non-production resources. But we see a lot of customers implementing um, controls at the root level, which are true for your complete organization. So you can have controls like, do not allow any of my member accounts to leave my organization. You can have controls like, do not allow usage of root user. You do not want people to be using root user every now and then. It should only be used to break glass access. And then if you only operate in certain regions, you can have regional controls over there as well. But as you go down in the hierarchy at the OU level or the account level, we see customers implementing more granular controls. They will say, if you are attaching a SCP at the security OU level, it will say something like, do not allow anyone to modify or delete my security services. Or it could have more privileged access controls as well. So this was the first one, but based on this, we see customers evolving and rearranging their accounts as per their need. So the first commonly seen pattern is a micro account strategy, where on the left, you still have your foundational OU, where you still have your infrastructure and security uh, OUs, and you still have that security tooling, global shared services over there. But on the right, you have three different OUs created for development, testing, and production. And this kind of structure is basically implemented by organizations that want to test different controls that they implement at each of these OUs, development, testing, and production, for the so software development lifecycle. So they create one account in each of these OUs, and then as their product or application is being built, they want to test it out against different sets of controls as they are moving from very lenient controls in development to more restrictive controls in production. So we see customers implementing broader set of services are allowed in the development OU, where you are allowing your developers to create more applications, use more services, but as you go towards testing and production, you are allowing only services that are used by your applications in production. Or you can have more stricter controls in production that says, do not allow anyone to delete my critical S3 buckets that host my production data. And then the other pattern that we see is by organizations that operate in multiple geo locations. So on the left, you still have your global shared services, which hosts your infrastructure and security. But you create a top level OU based on the continents that you operate in because a lot of customers have different applications. Maybe they run in different uh, currencies, they have a different language they have to support or they have data residency needs. So they create top level OU based on the continent that they operate in and then they create another nested layer of OU based on the countries where those applications are running. So. At the Asia Pacific or Americas, they'll have regional controls, which won't allow their developers to use services in any other region that AWS supports. And if you have any compliance frameworks or regulatory frameworks that you have to comply by, you can only allow those services which are compliant with those frameworks at that level. Uh, on the right, you have mergers and acquisitions. Um, we see this in uh, organizations that anticipate mergers and acquisitions or are acquiring other companies. So they use base set of SCPs, baseline SCPs that should be 
uh, use like the minimum bear controls. Mergers and acquisitions OU is used as a landing spot while the business decisions are still being made against those newly acquired accounts from newly acquired company. So they are used as a landing spot. You move accounts and workloads over there while you are still deciding, but they'll get that baseline controls. And then at the country level, you can have more stricter data residency needs where you can say like, do not allow my data to move out of uh, Singapore region. Do not allow um, people using my application in Mumbai to be able to send it to um, Singapore. We have one more architecture, but uh, it will be in Tulio's slides, which is quite different as well. So keep an eye out for that. So we have another poll, the second poll for this session. If you have any of these structures resonating for your business, um, we would like to uh, know if it resonates what we have learned from a lot of our customers. And if not, then I would like to have an interesting discussion after this session with you. So let's wait for all the polls to come in. If you cannot scan the QR code, you can still use the link that is on the screen and uh, put the six digit code to access the poll. Okay, let's look at the results. Wow, so we see 47 getting started with AWS recommended. Perfect, so that re it definitely resonates with us. But if you are using any other kind of uh, AWS structure, organization structure, I would like to know more about it. So feel free to stay back after the session. So we talked about one big consideration, which was design your OU structure according to your security and operational needs. But there are other key considerations as well, which you should use as questions that you ask yourself while you are writing SCPs or maybe modifying them. The second one is leverage uh, SCPs with deny. As we looked into the evaluation of SCP with deny, you only need to have one anywhere in your hierarchy for a particular permission or, or a service to be denied. So apply denies at higher up in your organization so that they are applicable to a broader group of accounts or a broader group of OUs in your organization. One of the examples is do not allow any of my member accounts to leave my organization, which is a good one because you do not want any of your member accounts to leave your organization. So if you apply it at the root level, this OU account A and account B, account B will have this SCP applicable to them. The third key consideration is only apply coarse grain controls using SCPs. You have a lot of other identity and resource based policies at your disposal to put other controls in place. Although you can put all those controls in SCPs as well, but there are a limited number of SCPs today that you can apply in your organization. So please do not put everything in SCPs. Use identity and resource-based policies to define more fine-grained controls that only apply to maybe some principles or some accounts, but use SCPs for the controls that apply to broader set of uh, resources in your organization. And, um, Use them to implement security invariants, like controls that should not be inverted intentionally or unintentionally by anyone. So we talked about the number of policies that you can apply is limited, but there is also a policy size that is limited. So you can only write a SCP that is 500, 100, 5120 bytes long. You cannot have that limit ex extended. So it's a hard limit. So you really want to write a consolidated and compact SCP when you're implementing them. And if you have any white spaces, those do count towards that character limit. So have a small piece of code that goes ahead and removes those white spaces for you before you go ahead and deploy them in your environment. If you use AWS Management Console to deploy SCPs, it does it by default. But we do have some resources available, which I'll share at the end of this session 
which has that code that you can just reuse readily to remove that white space. And like all IAM policies, uh, SCPs also support statement ID or SID value, which is an optional field. A uh, lot of our customers use it to put description about what the policy does. So if you're not using it for any purposes, those also count towards a character limit. So go ahead and remove it. And we'll see where you can put that detail if you're using it as well later on. And then if you have exhausted all the other resources for implementing SCPs, and if you have more controls that you want to implement, think of alternatives that you can use for enforcing those controls other than SCPs. So we see a lot of our customers using an SCP that says, do not allow anyone to modify or delete my CloudTrail logs. But there is a feature with organization level CloudTrail. If you have that enabled, it by default doesn't allow any of the member accounts to do it. None of the member accounts have permission to modify or delete that CloudTrail. They can only read it. So if you enforce that control using that feature, you can get that control out of the SCP. But if you're not running out of the quota limits, just use both. It's always good to have defense in depth. And then make use of resource policies. Um, if you have SCP that says, do not allow anyone to upload objects to my S3 buckets if they are not encrypted, you can rather move it to S3 bucket level rather than at a SCP level if you want to put more uh, controls in SCP that are more important for you as compared to this one. So leverage other IAM policy types, like permissions boundary. And this is the last key consideration. So one important thing to note is SCPs that have allow statements in them do not support global condition keys. But if you take advantage of the deny statements, you can make use of global condition keys. So one of the global condition keys is AWS principal tag. You can write a SCP that is scoped down to a particular principal tag, like the one shown on the screen over here. But that is only possible if you use deny with this global condition key. Um, another important point to note over here, especially if you are using tag-based access control is have controls in place that do not allow anyone other than privileged roles and users to be able to change the modify the tags or delete them or put them on resources because you are doing all of your access control using those tags. So have those kind of controls in place before you implement this condition key and make use of tags. The another condition key that we normally see a lot of our customers use is uh, AWS principal account. And this one is normally seen where they want to allow, let's say, a set of services in one account and a different set of services in another account. So they can differentiate between those two accounts using this condition key. So you can say deny usage of these services if this is not the account or deny usage of these services if it is not this account or a group of accounts. So this is a very good condition key to use as well if you want to scope down your SCP to a particular account or group of accounts. So uh, we talked a lot about like key considerations and things you should keep in mind while you're writing SCPs or modifying them but you would not be able to leverage the advantages of them if you have multiple people making changes to SCPs or writing SCPs for your organization. You need a central place from where the SCPs are written, reviewed, and deployed. And because of which we recommend that you have an automated deployment of SCPs for your organization so that your security operations team is the only one making changes to SCPs. And if you use a CI CD pipeline or infrastructure as code or AWS code pipeline, then you always have that history of the changes being made to your service control policies. So this is just an example uh, where your security operations team gets started with uh, committing code, new changes, modifications to your SCPs or making them more restrictive. If you're going towards least privilege, you can have a code build phase in that that basically parses that change being made 
gets your service control policy out of the changes being made, gets that file for you, and then you can run that against IAM Access Analyzer. So IAM Access Analyzer is a tool that you can use to make sure that the policy grammar looks okay, that the JSON looks okay, and it, you can also validate your SCP against the AWS best practices. So it will give you alerts. So you can validate it against IAM Access Analyzer. And then as we talked about, you can have a piece of code that removes those white spaces, removes the SID value from it if you're not using it. So it minifies your SAP. And you can still have a review process where a human goes and checks before the SCPs are deployed because they can be disruptive if you're making them very restrictive and if you don't know what is the business criticality of your applications. So it's important to have someone review it before they are deployed. Um, as of last year, CloudFormation started supporting AWS organizations. So now you can implement SCPs. You can create them, modify them um, using CloudFormation templates. So you can also add one more layer into it where you use CloudFormation templates to implement SCPs in your organization. And then uh, SCPs today do not have an audit mode. So we recommend that you implement them first in your development side of organization. Let them run for a few days, see nothing breaks, and then implement the same SCP in the production. And then we talked about removing that statement ID or SID value. SCPs do have a field called policy description. You'll see it in console. Uh, where you can put description about your policy. You can also use this field to put a commit version that you can use to um, see what SCPs are applied in your development and production if there is a difference, like we talked about. So it's, uh, it could be a helpful field if even if you use SID values, you can move those um, descriptions out of your policy itself. And then uh, finally, um, we have a delegated administrator feature now that you can leverage. So now you can move the management of your organization policies or SCPs out of your management account. You do not want people to be logging into your management account for making changes to SCPs. You should only use it for break glass access. So now you can move out the management of SCPs uh, out of the management account. Um, common grievance that we hear from a lot of developers is that uh, they get access denies from service control policies, but they do not know what service control policies are applied to their accounts or resources. So with this feature, you can give them that read-only access on the service control policies that are applied to them. Um, however, some companies might still want to keep uh, their SCP secret, so that's something to consider. Uh, delegation works a little bit different uh, with this feature. You write a resource-based policy, attach it in your organization's management account. Uh, and in that resource-based policy, you can write what actions are allowed for a particular member account to perform on your organization level policies. So you can list out the actions so you can go more granular in that. And then finally, this feature applies to all the organization level policies, backup policies, stack policies, AI, uh, opt-out service policies. So it's not only um, for SCPs, but think about this feature as you, uh, uh, as you move the delegation or management of uh, SCPs out of your management account. And with that, uh, I will hand it over to Tulio to walk us through Inter's journey of implementing SCPs. There you go. Okay, thank you very much, Swara. Hello, everyone. Again, I'm Tulio Bita. I'm 26 years old and I work as a senior cloud security architect at Inter & Co. So, over the years, sorry, I have to pass the, <laughs> the slides, okay? Uh, so, continuing, um, in the recent years, Inter has made some acquisitions of companies and my team and I have has been working hard to integrate the infrastructure of those companies into our organization. So I was invited by AWS to show you how Inter & Co manages and groups 
those multiple companies inside a single AWS organization. So let's talk about Internet Co. What kind of company is it? So Internet Co, we like to say that it is a Brazilian technology company which offers a complete platform for day-to-day -day banking, investments, credit, insurance, and cross-border transactions, all gathered in a single place. We also have a full marketplace in our platform where you can book flights, order food, and buy products from the biggest retail stores in the country. And the most important thing is, all that you buy comes with cashback. So let's start with a quick introduction, talking about the evolution of Inter & Co. over the years. So it all started in 1994, when Inter was founded as a financial company in Brazil, called Intermedium. And over the years, we went through some rebranding, as you can see, till we get to what we are today, Inter & Co. Back in 2008, we received authorization from the Central Bank of Brazil to become a real bank. And then in 2015, here comes the revolution. Understanding the people's pain in relation to banking services, uh, we were the first bank to offer a 100% free digital bank account to our customers. So that means that any person in Brazil could open an account fully remotely just by using their smartphone. No need to get out of the, of the home to open an account. So it was at this moment that our number of accounts being opened just skyrocketed. And uh, because of that, our on-premises infrastructure could no longer support the high demand. That was the time that when Inter and AWS joined forces to lead a banking revolution in Brazil, making Inter the first bank to migrate 100% of financial services to the cloud. So it was very hard, complex, no one had done it before, and we did it together with AWS. So in 2000, uh, oh, and I forgot, in, at that point, we had only 100,000 accounts uh, to manage, okay? Then in 2019, we launched a super app. As our goal was always to offer multiple services to our customers, um, in this platform, we made that possible, combining our day-to-day -day banking with a complete investment platform, a marketplace where you could do your online shopping and many other non-financial services. At that point, we were already with 2 million bank accounts in our bank. So then 2020, we doubled that number to 4 million. 2021, 8 million. 2022, 16 million. So we doubled year over year that, time, that number of accounts. And now, today, 20, um, 2023, we have already um, over 26 million bank accounts to manage. And we're still in June. So we hope to get that doubled uh, at the end of the year. And we also uh, offered, uh, started to offer this year our global accounts to, to the customers where they can use their, their account all over the world. So that's a great advantage for us. And also, we're proud to say that we are listed on NASDAQ and have been recently approved to operate as a broker here in the United States. So as you can see, you have, we have been reinventing the way people use financial and non-financial services um, in Brazil. And we have been working hard to bring this experience to the United States as well. And to make all this possible, the evolution of our business has been driven by the acquisitions of companies along the journey. And because all we wanted was to offer multiple services to our customers and um, wide, make wide portfolio of services. Now, based on the story I told you now, I want you to imagine a scenario. We had 100,000 bank accounts by 2016. And that was the year that we started the migration of our workloads to the AWS. Then, seven years later, we went from that 100,000 to over 26 million bank accounts. So imagine the security challenge behind the management of a multi-account AWS organization running multiple workloads on AWS. So because of the resiliency in the infrastructure that we have today, 
we're able to process more than 10 million app authentications a day and more than 1 million API calls a minute. And all that without downtime. So we dealt with some challenges during the journey. Uh, Internet Core is very dynamic, as you could see, and the security team needs to go along with the speed that the company and customers grow. So, um, and with our wide range of services and big number of AWS accounts to manage, troubleshooting has become a challenge too. So it was taking a long time to identify the potential problems in our infrastructure, and we realized that the SCPs we had were insufficient to protect all the environment. So also, for each company acquisition, we have the mission to bring the infrastructure of these companies to our AWS organization and make it compliance with all the security standards we follow. Conclusion to all that, with Inter's growth, troubleshooting difficulties and acquisitions of companies over the years, we needed to make multiple changes in our SCPs so that the, our security enforcement don't impact our services. But that's not the way to go. We didn't want to do that because SCPs were not designed to be modified so frequently. So we needed to come up to think of a work project to solve these problems. But where to start? Before moving forward, I would like to mention a phrase said by my manager, Dino, which is, é mais eficiente se você gastar muito tempo planejando do que executando. <laughs> For those who didn't understand me speaking in Portuguese, I'll tell you in English too. So it is more efficient when you spend a lot of time planning rather than executing. That means don't rush when you're planning the project. If you think of all the details, all project requirements, surprises you can get in the future, and impacts that, that you may cause, you will spend less effort during the execution. Because when you get to the execution point, you will know exactly what to do. You'll be able to prepare yourself for all the surprises during the execution, and also you can think of the plan B. So that's a great lesson I learned while working with him. And so we followed his advice during this, this work project. We started by setting up the plan, the strategy, before putting our hands dirty. So the first thing we thought was that we needed to elaborate an optimized and definitive AWS account structure. We needed to arrange all the companies in a way that their accounts would keep isolated from themselves. And also, new SCPs have to be created to meet the different needs of each company. And all this expecting to have some benefits. So, first of all, the solution needs to be scalable. It needs to be easy to manage so that you can take a look at the infrastructure and understand what is there pretty fast and easy. And most important, keep the high level of security in each layer of protection. So, just to mention, guys, the implementation of this project took us about one year to be done. This is a long time to think and execute. Now we have our last polling, polling question of the session. So feel free to scan the QR code and, or enter the link to, to answer us. So I would like to know if you use automation to implement SCPs today. Which of you think about automating your environment so that you can take advantage of that? So. Um, I would, uh, I would like to know if you are prepared for that. <laughs> okay, so let's see the results. All right, that's a good result. That's interesting. Uh, so 46% responded no. That's very interesting. So. Um, that's a great opportunity for you to, to see what I have uh, next. So I will explain to you how uh, we implement the SCPs. So moving on. Uh, now we get to the execution. So how did the, the project execution go? We decided to use Infra's code to provision resources in AWS. 
Inter makes use of infrastructure as code as an automation tool for quite some time. And we use it to manage all the AWS environment. So by elaborating templates, scripts, CI-CD pipelines, we can provision a whole architecture in AWS. There are infinite numbers of possibilities using infra as code. In our case, most of AWS services are already incorporated into our pipelines. I can say like 95%. For example, by using infra as code, we can run EC2 instances, S3 buckets, create IAM roles, or entire AWS accounts already with all the security enforcements implemented and security services enabled, such as CloudTrail, Config, Security Hub, and all our automations already deployed in the pipelines. All right? And these resources managed by Infra's code, they are already hardened, yeah? regarding the security standards we follow, and they come with, with lots of tags, which makes it easy to identify a resource. So as Infra's code exclusively manages all resources in the AWS organization, no employee is allowed to create, modify, or delete any AWS resource directly in the AWS console. They can only do this by Infra's code. And I, I, will, I will explain to you in the next slide. So, uh, the use of Infra's code comes with lots of benefits. So, it allows the security team to create uh, security enforcements directly in the pipelines. We can create enforcements before the creation of the resources um, in, the, in the AWS environment. Also, version control. So, we have a timeline of each resource and the modifications that were made during the time. This is very good to see all the all the history of the resources. Also, tag management. So every AWS resource in Inter comes with 13 tags. And those tags specify solution, the cost center, the squad responsible by that solution, by that resource, and many other tags. So um, this is very good for the governance team because they will be able to identify the teams responsible for each solution. And it's pretty easy to, to find out. It also serves as a rollback mechanism. For example, imagine that you update the properties of an S3 bucket in a production account. So, and um, after you, you modify that property, uh, an application crashes. So all you have to do is pick the, la the latest version of that, um, of that bucket and do a rollback. This is good because um, the chances of human failure drops because using infra as code, everything is automated. You can automate all things, all the process. And in addition to all this, infra as code, as code also allows the teams in Inter to review and approve the resources provisioned in AWS. So we add a review point in the pipelines. Each team is responsible for approving certain types of services. For example, the cloud security team um, is responsible for evaluating the resources um, related to security, such as IAM, KMS, um, SCPs, or any other, any resource-based policy um, in the AWS. So that resource will only be authorized for creation, modification, or deletion after it has been reviewed by the responsible team. And that applies to all the resources, the, the databases, RDS, DynamoDB, the database team is responsible for that review, and so on, and we go on. So this review and approval process is uh, another layer of security implemented in the pipelines. Now, how did we elaborate our AWS accounts in the organization to meet our requirements? That's the the other account structure that Suara was saying. So, first of all, we have an OU called Intergroup, which contains the global accounts that will support all the accounts and all the companies in the business. So, access to these accounts is limited to a few squads from IT and security teams, because these accounts will run essential services, which are critical to the business, 
So we don't want everybody to access those accounts. Those accounts will have the logs from CloudTrail, all the security tools implemented, and many other features. And uh, so, okay. Um, now, what happens when Inter acquires a new company? So, thanks to our InfraScode automations, um, we are able to, to run uh, an automation <laughs> and we create five new AWS accounts for that company. And we'll put them in a dedicated OU to isolate from the, the rest of the environment. And these accounts will be created with all the security and compliance requirements um, already implemented. Come with CloudTrail enabled config and everything else. Then Inter and Co makes another acquisition. What do we do? So we run the automation again, and that company receives five new AWS accounts to deploy the resources. And this is just to begin. If we need, if that company is, if that company is, is raising, is growing a lot, we can create new accounts for that company pretty easily using Infra's code. All right, so um, depending on the necessity of each company, we can uh, scale up those accounts. And like that, we guarantee the isolation of the companies and their resources and also scalability. We can put any amount of companies inside our organization by using this structure. Now, here are some examples of SCPs implemented in our AWS organization so that you can take a look and maybe take a note. So the first one is regions allowed. This SCP restrict the, restricts the use of specific regions to deploy resources. This is a business strategy for us because we want to keep control of where our workloads are running. We don't want anybody to use a region that we are not commonly using. <coughs> the second SCP is a security enforcement attached at the root level. So we restrict so, to some critical services um, such as CloudTrail, Config, AWS organizations such as SCPs and so on. Um, <clears throat> because these resources need extreme care and attention to be managed. So I believe this kind of SCP should be implemented in any multi-account environment from AWS. All right. And the next SCP is very important for us. It denies the creation, deletion, and modification of any resource that is already incorporated in Infra's code. Um, so, because in our pipelines, we can keep the resources hardened and secure, well protected. So, this is good because we don't want the employees to modify and and put any resource at risk. The fourth SCP example is about KMS. This SCP prevents a production KMS to be disabled or deleted. Why that? Why to do this? Because we all know that if a KMS is deleted, all the data that was encrypted by that KMS will be gone. You won't have access to it anymore. So this SCP is special and is attached to each of our production accounts individually. The next SCP is designed to protect our most critical buckets inside the organization. Those buckets will contain information that need to be restricted and well protected. And we have more than one SCP like, in, like this. So we have an SCP like that in the root level and for one of one of, uh, for some companies, we also need to, to deploy an SCP to protect some buckets that contain sensitive information. And here's another interesting SCP, which is VPN login. So our users, our employees can only log in to the AWS console or AWS CLI if they are coming from one of Inter's VPN IPs. So keep in mind that this is very possible by using SCPs in our organization. And the seventh SCP is a restriction for snapshots. 
allowing them to be shared only within our organization accounts, never to an account outside the organization. So we want to keep our images protected and isolated so that we don't provide a data leak or something like that. And most important of SCPs, we have security enforcements for each company. Those security enforcements are customized regarding each company's needs. So as an example, there is one company in our organization that needs to be compliant with the PCI DSS security standard. And we use this SCP to protect the buckets that contain confidential information so that only the application role can have access to them. And we also protect some crucial resources from being deleted, accidentally deleted. So this is an extra uh, protection for those resources that need to run 24-7 and they can't be modified and deleted accidentally. So <coughs> I reinforce for you that there is at least one customized SCP like that for each company in the intergroup. Moving on, so these are some advantages that we achieved during this, after this work project was done. So we now have security scalability. So with infrared code automations, we can provision new AWS accounts pretty easily. So it's a game changer for us. Also security in layers. So the SCPs can be attached in the root level, in the company level if we want, or if it's still necessary in the account level individually. And uh, by the way, we made this project and uh, we, could, uh, we, we took care about the quota limits of AWS. So we didn't exceed at any time that five uh, SCP limit for each layer. And also troubleshooting efficiency. This was the best advantage for us. So um, with this account structure that we designed, we're able to identify the problems pretty easily and much faster because everything is organized and clear to see. Now here are some lessons learned during this implementation that are important to take a note. So first of all, understand who has access to what in your environment. So try to identify the resources that might be affected by the SCPs you're deploying. Uh, during the implementation, we made use of CloudTrail, AWS Athena, and IAM to search for the most used API calls in our environment. We search for the most critical roles too to understand what they are doing in the environment, because we don't want we we want to avoid any impact to those roles and services. Next, take time to set a strategy. Again. Don't rush during project planning. So think of all possibilities, every detail, all the surprises you may have. I'm pretty sure that this will save you time later in the execution. And third one, third, documentation makes troubleshooting easier. So keep documentation clear and organized is very important for your company because anybody who gives a quick look at it will be able to understand your AWS organization and all the SCPs you have. So that way, if you understand the environment you're dealing with, troubleshooting will be easy. In addition, documentation will help your new employees to understand the infrastructure much faster. And to finish, uh, communication equals less production impact. So we needed to understand the whole infrastructure and the business to make it happen. So we talked to a lot of IT teams, product teams, development teams to understand every detail and uh, think of all the impacts we could cause in the environment because we, di we didn't want to, to make complications in the environment. So this is one important lesson we learned while implementing this work project. Good communication is always important when you're dealing with critical production environments. Now I'd like to give the stage back to Swara. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Tulio. 
So uh, these are the last few slides, uh, the key takeaways from this session. Um, as Julio uh, said, and I would like to reinforce, please take time to set a correct OU structure that resonates with your security and operational needs. And curate it, talk to your developer teams, talk to all the teams before you uh, set it up so that you are not breaking any business critical applications while writing SCPs. Uh, define a base set of SCPs. These are the controls that should be baked into your organization, no matter what OU or where the account lies. These are the base set of controls, security invariants that every account should comply by in your organization. Uh, use the key considerations that we talked about as questions that you ask yourself while writing SCPs and making modifications to them. Ask yourself, did I set the right OU structure? Did I leverage the denies? Am I using it at the top level in my hierarchy? Ask yourself these questions when you are making modifications to your SCPs today. And then uh, we saw not a lot of you use automation, so give it a thought. Um, see if you can centralize the changes being made to SCPs in your environment today. Um, it will make uh, it easier and you can leverage all the benefits that Tulio just talked about. And then also think about moving the management of SCPs out of your management account. Now it is possible with the delegated administrator feature. So think about the automation and uh, the delegation of uh, SCPs. We have some resources uh, that you can leverage. Um, just a couple of months back, we released a GitHub repository that has SCP examples. Uh, you can just copy paste SCPs from here and leverage them in your environment. Um, first, test it out. Do not roll them out into your production environment. Make sure that they do not break anything. Um, the next one is a blog on getting more out of your SCPs that has that piece of code that I talked about that removes those white spaces for you and removes the statement ID. So you can just grab that code from there. And it also goes in depth into some of the key considerations that we talked about. Uh, we have a really nice white paper that talks about uh, organizing your AWS accounts as a whole, that talks about a lot of things outside of SCPs and organizational level policies as well. So uh, give it a look. And then finally, we have best practices um, resource over here that you can use for implementing SCPs in your multi-account environment. Uh, this goes above um, the key considerations that we talked about today. So it's a good resource. Um, if you have not clicked pictures today, uh, we will be sharing out the slides later on. So uh, have a look out for that. And then uh, finally, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, we had really fun. Uh, presenting uh, this content to you. We look forward to the session survey. Let us know if we can make this better, if there is something that did not resonate with you. Uh, we also have our LinkedIn IDs on the screen. Uh, I would be happy to hear from you if you have a different take on SCPs, how you implement them. Uh, if you would like to learn any more about it, I would be happy to help you best of my ability. And then feel free to reach out to Tulio if you wanna know more about Inter. Open an account, get cash back. Uh, all that fun stuff. And thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. <laughs>